Wow, great song. I never heard that. Very nice. Thank you, as always, musicians. <laughs> it always makes my heart sing to be with you. And, <laughs> and I am particularly grateful to Reverend Jimmy for inviting me to share with you today. So this is... Um, special for me. It might have been um, a correct prediction when <clears throat> I went on Facebook the other day and the ad that Bertie had put in there as she always does about today came up with some extra stuff I don't think she included. It said, um, be the light and spiritual cafe with Reverend Ron Fritz, Sunday, 11 a.m., 70 to 79 degrees and thunderstorms. <laughs> <laughs> now, <clears throat> what I've found as I've shared some of the things I'm going to share with you today in some other places, it even though it's about the light, it seems to create some mental and spiritual thunderstorms for some folks. So that's, uh, that's your warning. In the Christian scriptures, in a document known as the Gospel of Matthew, are the words that are attributed to Jesus as part of what is commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So here's the thing. You are it. You are it. You are the light. Now I don't know about you, but when I contemplate that truth, I, it is at once, at one time, freeing, empowering, and daunting to realize I'm it. I'm the light. It's my job to shine that light to the world. Now in another place in the Christian scriptures we're told that Jesus said to his disciples and followers near the end of his ministry go into all the world and teach them what I've taught you. Make them disciples. In other words, share this light. And what we know to be true from history is that that happened. There was a great spreading of that light. There was a great spreading of the things that Jesus had taught, which turned into the Christian church, the religion of Christianity. What we also know to be true is apparently, and it makes sense, those early disciples and church leaders didn't fully yet comprehend what that really meant. And as things progressed, what happened was that Jesus' teachings in many cases, in many ways, became what Eric Butterworth calls the religion about Jesus instead of the religion of Jesus. Now, in the 1800s, there was a movement that began known as New Thought, something that unity grew out of, something that Charles and Myrtle Fillmore were key leaders in that New Thought movement that turned into being what we are now a part of, which is unity. But 
Here's something that Charles Fillmore said about this enlightenment, about this light. Enlightenment is of little or no value unless we continue to mature spiritually and emotionally. Pretty early in my service as a spiritual leader in unity, I was invited to a party at the home of um, one of the musicians that worked at our church. And so there were several other unity persons there, but it was not primarily unity persons. It was probably mostly people that didn't really know anything about unity. And I happened to be in the kitchen and overhear a conversation going on between one of those persons who, who knew really nothing about unity and a person who was a long time unitic. <laughs> she had been in unity for many years. And the question she was asked is, so what does unity believe? And her answer was, oh, pretty much what other churches believe. Now, I was just a baby in unity, but I gasped at that. <laughs> I held my tongue and didn't respond, but folks, as one who came out of a fundamentalist Christian church. I declare to you, in case you're not aware of it or have forgotten, what we teach and believe in unity is radically different from most of the Christian world. Radically different. My goal today is to invite you to look at that and look at the meaning, the, the, the meaning of that, to look at what our role in sharing that light is, having been enlightened, I would say, in a greater way, but certainly in a different way than most of the Christian world has been. To invite you to, to consider what that means, and particularly what that means for us as we live into that truth. So I'm going to uh, encourage you, oh, there we go. Oh, I know, they couldn't train me how to use the remote, so <laughs> we have to do this, but. One of my favorite spiritual practices has become asking questions. And as my friend, Reverend Dr. Bill Holton says, questioning unquestioned answers. Questioning the answers that have always been given. Even the answers that have been long given in unity. To even question that and contemplate those things. So, I'm going to invite you to live in some of those questions with me and if I get you really intrigued, perhaps you'll choose to stay afterwards for a spiritual cafe, which I'll say a little bit more about in a few minutes. Uh, but whether I do or not, I hope I can encourage you to keep asking questions, keep seeking, keep um, working to go deeper into what it means to be the light. So we have in unity these uh, five basic beliefs. Some people call them uh, basic principles. Some people call them uh, basic truths. Basic, but I, I call them basic beliefs because what they are is, in my mind, is kind of the primary uh, belief system uh, that, that most of us uh, have in unity or recognize in unity. Uh, and this is just a kind of a little shorthand that I learned for those things. So let's just look at those and think about what it means to be the light in the sense of what we believe in unity in these five things. So the first one is God is. God is everywhere present and all good. 
We, we say that. M many unity churches, and you have done it in the past, I'm sure, and probably do it on occasion, uh, begin the service with this early, with this affirmation, there's only one presence and one power in my life and in the universe, God the good omnipotence. So what's that mean? Because do you get it that most of the Christian world sees God as some sort of being out there somewhere different from us, other than us, that we pray to and worship and praise? It's other than us. And what it has become, in many cases, is uh, God is much like a, a, a judge that determines right and wrong and, uh, and, and dishes out reward or punishment, or uh, a ruler that sort of manipulates things and works things, or uh, maybe more like Santa Claus, uh, who doles out grace to us whether we deserve it or not, uh, any number of images of this being other than us. Someone said, um, God created humans, and ever since, humans have been trying to return the favor. <laughs> and it's pretty accurate, isn't it? We make God into a giant us. We, we think of God as thinking like we do, acting like we do, having the same kind of feelings and so on and so forth. And I'm, and I'm frankly flabbergasted by some of the things I hear in reference to God. But I have to always reflect back to, the, to my childhood and my early adult years when I was an ordained minister in a, an evangelical church and realize that that's what I used to believe. <laughs> that's what I used to teach. But what we believe in unity, at least what I believe, is that God is not a person at all, not a being at all. God is an intelligence or a mind, a presence, we say, and a power. And we are one with that. Now the second one of these talks about us and says basically we're like God. <laughs> I am uh, sometimes it's said I have the spark of the divine I would suggest it's more than a spark it's your DNA it's who you are it's your actual spiritual true self and so we are divine so we have what we call we think of humans as having the an original blessing as opposed to what most of Christianity has as a belief, which is original sin. They believe that we're, most Christian churches teach that either we're born sinners, and that's why, by the way, they baptize children, babies, in, most, in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases. And, or if we're not born in sin, it's inevitable that we will turn into sinners. <laughs> That's what we will become. That's not what we teach in unity. We teach that we're divine. That we're, that we're good. And yes, that has to be developed, and yes, we can block that light, and yes, there's errors that come into our thinking, but our basic core nature is good and is divine. Now, these first two alone separate us from most of Christianity. And I just, I, I, I've come across a lot of folks in unity that don't seem to realize that, including sometimes I think some of our ministers don't seem to get it that we're not like them. We don't believe the same things. We don't have the same theology. And I believe that's part of the light that we're to be sharing and being in the world. But when you think about those two things together, a third thing comes that's very different in our belief system, which is what we think about Jesus. Because we don't see Jesus as the Savior of the world. We see Jesus as our brother, our teacher, 
our model. Most of the Christian world views Jesus as out there with God somewhere. Part of God. Part of a trinity. Which we don't even believe in except in a metaphysical sense. So we're very different. I was kind of hoping that I'd get some of that yes that I heard earlier. <laughs> we're very different in our beliefs about Jesus. I'll never forget, I was at a, um, I attended a Jewish service one time at a synagogue in the town where I was serving, and I went uh, afterwards to the gathering they had, and I was talking to what I think they called the president of the synagogue, and uh, he says to me, so what, what, is, what kind of things does unity believe? And as we talked, I said to him, well, one of the big differences about us is that we don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. We believe he's our brother, you know, whatever. And he's like, yeah, neither do we. <laughs> so those, those three things are radical differences. Now, when, you, when we get into the next, you probably know more about these next couple, but there's certainly some differences there too. And I, I'm not by any means touching on all our differences uh, all the, the things we see as part of the light that are different. But um, certainly uh, we talk about creating our own experience. We heard about that already this morning. So as I think, as I believe, my opinions, all that creates my experience. So we don't believe in heaven after death and hell after death. We believe you can those occur right here based on our thoughts, beliefs, opinions, and how we choose to experience what happens. And I love to say, we don't control what happens. We control what we think about what happens. What we experience, how we experience what happens. Stuff just happens. I don't know for sure why I think it happens, but stuff happens. But I always have a choice as to how I experience what happens, how I deal with what happens. The fourth um, is that our prayer is not about begging or pleading or asking for things from God or Jesus, but rather it's about affirming, affirming the truth that we know. It's about going to that space where we remember, where we realize that we are divine, that we are good, that we are like God, that we in fact are the Christ. One of the things we, we do in unity, I've always experienced since I came into unity, is we have this thing about saying the Christ in you. And the Christ in you for me sounds a little bit like a hot dog in a bun. The truth is you are the Christ. You are the Christ. I am the Christ. And in unity, that, that's just the way we refer to that divinity that is us. But you understand that not only in most of the Christian world, but even in most of the world that doesn't go to church much, like the media, when you hear the word Christ, it's the same thing as Jesus. They're just talking about that person, that same person. They're not talking about, as we are, the Christ that is our highest self, that is our, that is our divinity, our good. So, being the light, I think, in unity has some very different meanings from what most of the Christian world thinks about, or thinks it means. And um, here are some suggestions of how I think that plays out for us. So I think it, it, it's in our spiritual practices where we come to greater and greater understanding of what it means to be the light and how to live into that. And it's different for all of us. How, how I be the light won't be the same as how you be the light. So part of what we have to do is not only 
come to a greater understanding of what it means that I'm the light, but a, but a greater uh, understanding of what I do with that, how I live into that. And uh, I've already suggested that questioning is one of the things that, that I think is an important spiritual practice practices. Classes and discussion is, a, is another one. Um, there's a guy by the name of Steven Johnson who actually um, did some research and then did some talking and writing about where do good ideas come from. And not surprising to me at all, what he came up with was the best ideas come in coffee house environments. Classes and discussion. Sitting down with each other, sharing, asking questions, debating even. And um, in Unity, usually we have lots of opportunity for that. And you've got a great one coming up, I just got to tell you. I mean, I wish, I kind of wish I was around at noons on Wednesdays the next few days, the uh, next few weeks, because uh, the power of now that Reverend Jimmy's going to lead a discussion in is, is a tremendous uh, book. Just one of the ways that, that we can do that. Uh, it, it's also, I think, by changing our language. And I, there's a fair amount of resistance, I find, uh, in unity to that. Um, because we kind of get set in our ways and we kind of use the same language we've always used, even though our, our ideas have changed, our understandings have changed. And people will say, well, I, I know what I mean. I know what that means. Well, then why not do the work to find language that says what you mean? <laughs> uh, because that language will not only express it, it will change how you experience things. It will change how you show up uh, in the world. So this afternoon, uh, 1230, um, we're going, I'm going to offer uh, what several of us have been doing uh, lately called Spiritual Cafe. Um, I admit that I well, I didn't steal this because I asked permission uh, of some friends who started doing these. And a spiritual cafe is just really sort of like sitting around the kitchen table talking. That, that's kind of what it is. It's question and answer. And so if you're able to stay, I would love to play with you for a little longer on this topic. Just bounce some things around, ask questions, um, give answers. I'd love to hear some of the answers to my questions that I'm sure you uh, can share. <laughs> so uh, I would invite you to, to do that. Um, and in that I will share, uh, in, in, in the Spiritual Cafe, I will share uh, another new thing that I've been playing with uh, for a while now that's just, for me, really, really exciting called the adjacent possible. And it has all to do with our belief system and how we make some shifts and how we move into some of that. So. Um, I'll share that then, if, uh, if you're able to stay and be a part of it. But whether uh, you can or not, I invite you, I encourage you, I urge you, because I believe the world so badly needs it, to be the light, to be the more intense the more enlightened, the brighter light that we know because of being a part of unity. I invite you to go into the world and in your own unique way, in your own settings with the people that you engage. I'm not talking about changing them. I'm not talking about evangelizing. I'm just talking about being the light, living into your truth, standing up to the truth. So I invite you to do that, and I invite you now as we go into meditation to begin to let that sit a little. Let that be in your thought processes as you begin to think about what does it mean for me to be the light? And how do I live into that?
So close your eyes or let your gaze be downward. Breathing once again into that mysterious internal space that is our that is our mind, that is our spirit, that is a a place and an existence that we hardly even have the words to describe or define. Just take a moment to settle into that. To allow yourself to realize that you are the light. As you feel for that, as you contemplate that, allow in your vision, in your imagination, allow your thought to just sort of go out to either side of your physical space, in front, behind, and get a sense that that light that you are is emanating to all those around you. And yet, they are also shining right back. Feel the meaning that those lights are connecting. They're one. And so light is going out from you. And light is coming into you. And you are warmed by that. And you are emboldened by that. You are freed and empowered. And you are called to be that, to live that. And yet, however daunting that might seem, there is no reason to be concerned about how you show up as long as you are coming from that place of light that you are. So just take a moment or two to sit in that, to see what that feels like, to allow yourself to know that you are the light. Just for a few moments in the quiet. You are the light. You are surrounded by it. You are filled by it. And all that is yours to do is simply be it. Let it shine. This message has been brought to you by Unity Church of San Antonio to open your heart, transform your life, and celebrate your divine identity. Visit us on the web at www.unityofsa.org. And remember, you are the light of God, so shine brightly today.